have an exciting interview for you, courtesy of Jeff from Arcade Hollywood. And we happen to be at the Pinball Expo and, not, and Alan Reisman, who used to work for Bally Industries years yeah. ago, he started working in 76. Yeah. He is one of the last survivors from that era of electronic pinball. So you saw the pinball machine come into fashion. But before we start with that, how did you get your job at Bally? I understand you lived nearby? I, worked, I went to school nearby. So I went to a, a school called DeVry uh, Tech. Okay. And their uh, Chicago campus was walking distance from Bally, literally on the other side of the river from where Bally was. DeVry made the old projectors, right? They, uh, they DeVry were... was a Bell & Howell company Bell and at okay. the time. They yeah. ran a, an electronic technology school. And that's where I was going to class. I was commuting there on uh, the train every day. So you were what? how old? Oh, I must have been 19, 20 years old at the time. Okay, okay. I had just gotten my um, draft registration card, as a matter of fact, ah. at the time. And I literally, in those days, companies had uh, personnel departments. You just walked into the personnel department and say, can I have a job? And I loved pinball. I still remember it. It was January 1st, 1976, the year Chicago legalized pinball. Pinball, pinball was illegal in Chicago, even though all the companies were here. Wow. On January 1st, I came back to school, and there were three new digital pinball machines in our, um, in our rec room at, uh, at uh, DeVry. And I said, I got to work for the company that makes these. Wow. So then that afternoon, I walked across the bridge. I knocked on the door at personnel, told them, hey, I'm going to be uh, graduating from school here in another year. I'd love to work for you. They put me to work that afternoon. That afternoon, do you remember what was the first game you worked on? I mean, when you walked in, what did you, the first thing the you did? The first thing I did was not a pinball machine. It was, we were just starting to use the microprocessor. Okay. So we developed a game called the Bally Alley, the, um, the Bally Lane. It was a bowling machine. It hung on the wall. So you had your bar and you had this big bowling machine. It hung on the wall and you had a little remote control at your tabletop. Okay. So you'd put a quarter in and you'd hold down a remote and this light would scan back and forth and you'd let go. And the ball would roll up. It was all done with light bulbs. The ball would roll up and knock pins down and you'd go bowling. Wow. And that was the first ever game it used a 4-bit microprocessor, a 4004. It was the Intel 4004 chip uh, was the first ever. And that was the first thing I worked on and they said to me, they said, well, we want you to do the radio receiver circuit. Can you do it? Well, I don't know much about radio. But here, here's a, here's a book from Radio Shack. So I looked at the book. I went over to Radio Shack. says, I need a crystal. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got this new CB radio crystal, uh, channel 34. Nobody uses channel 34. Take this crystal. So you put it in the game. And then, uh, like, overnight, you had the CB radio boom came. And everybody was broadcasting, you know, Breaker 1-9 and all that. As soon as somebody would go down the street uh, broadcasting on Channel 34, your game would go nuts. Oh. But it was, it was great. I had one of those. I was given one of those games, and it hung in my wall in my house for 40 years. I Only understand. You, you actually got it from Bally. That's right. They were cleaning out the warehouse. This they found that. 25 unsold games, and they went to the employees and said, who wants one? Go down to the warehouse. Talk to the manager there. Here's a ticket. They'll give you a game. Were they in the box? Yeah, brand new in the box. Wow, and I understand you had it up until? Uh, just like a year ago. After all those right. years, brand new out of the box in this man's house, yeah. and, and your, your, your children played it, they, you played everybody it, Everybody grew up playing it. All your friends played it, look at that. Yeah, everybody played it growing up. Um, so that was the first game I ever worked on. And then they, um, the, the first digital game was, they had just finished doing the designs for um, for bow and arrow, which was like a prototype. And how many bow and arrow prototypes? 11. Speculation was 11. I was going to say 10 or 11. Mm -hmm. I saw one. One was actually at one of the pinball expos once. Mm -hmm. And it used a real small display. The, I remember the, the digital numbers were tinier. There it was used a small display. because Nixie used, tubes. It or used, no, it didn't use Nixie tubes. It used a precursor to the standard uh, high voltage 
uh, vacuum gas displays that we had later on. And it was something on the bottom of the machine, right? Was the, the boards were in the bottom. Not in the head. Not in the head. The, and they, they, what they did was they just took a game that was in production. And they ripped, all, they ripped the guts out of it and replaced the guts with uh, electronic boards. And those boards were all like hand wired and okay. hand modified. We had a, a lab shop and some of the other guys they were modifying them. And then what they, because they were very suspicious of anybody really wanted digital pinball. The management was very conservative. They thought nobody would ever want these new digital pins. So we wound up putting the digital games side by side in the arcade next to the mechanical version of the same game. And the digital one, people preferred to play the digital ones. It's, it's natural. It's only natural. They played better. The, the bumpers were all DC and the, they bump bumper. Instantly. You could use software to control the bump of the bumper instead of uh, an analog switch. So you could, you could make that uniform. You could control that, give a nice good pulse. So bow and arrow, they made 11 samples, but bow and arrow was released as a mechanical. Yeah, well, that was not a, a production digital game. But, but there were 11 prototypes out there that collectors try to find, and they're out there. And so was it a whole year before they came out with the first yeah. digital? And was that... Uh, freedom. It was Freedom. Freedom, so freedom was, was the was first one, the first. and that one was made, again, there's a mechanical version and the digital version, because they still weren't sure about digital. Didn't there, a lot of Freedom sell? Uh, they only made like, oh, less than, I think, I don't know if they made 2,000 digital ones. Well, I'll tell you what, we're going to have, that's how many they made. See, we have the ability to float things in later. <laughs> and, and, and here's how many mechanicals they made. They had, no, they made more mechanicals. There's more mechanical freedoms and, out there. Well, but. you know, Gottlieb thought that too. They were, they were afraid nobody would want, you know, digital. And they did the same thing, but they, they continued making mechanicals for years mm -hmm. after the digitals came out. But Bally abandoned the mechanicals after what game? Well, there were, I think after Knight Rider. I, I, there was well, a- Matahari? Were there, there, were, there are prototype mechanical Mataharis out there. Okay. And there's a, there are prototypes Evil Knievels out there, but there were no production uh, mechanicals of those games. You, so the ones we find You are will prototypes. occasionally run into an electromechanical Matahari and an electromechanical Evil Knievel. I think I saw one at the, the, the Silver Bowl Museum in Asbury Park. It was obvious uh, after Knight Rider, it was obvious that digital was what people well, wanted. Well, you know what sold people on it? The memory feature was terrific. It could remember if you were a player two and you had this or that down, now, you could remember that. Now, if you recall, we did not use the memory feature until 8-Ball. Was it 8-Ball or... or 8-Ball uh, was the... That's why 8-Ball sold so many. It was the first multiplayer pin that could have memory and recall. And how many did they sell? Look at that number. The second highest production. Adam's right. family only beat it by five or 600, I think. So now I got a funny 8-Ball story. Oh, an 8-Ball story. Now we uh, get to the meat. <laughs> so everybody that works on pins from that era knows that there's like a little capacitor on every switch. 0.05 microfarad. So 8-Ball came out, we were getting calls from distributors, re dealers around the world saying, if you hit this target, it doesn't always register. That's right. We told them it was their fault. Mm -hmm. Switch wasn't adjusted right. Well, I got five more calls today about that. Nah, nah, the switch is wrong, it's dirty, clean it, it's fine. Are you sure? There's nothing wrong with it? No, no, the design, it'll scan that switch, it's fine. So in those days, that in the evening at night, we'd sometimes have little mini tournaments. We played for 25 cents a feature. So every time you got a feature on the play field, knocked down a bank of drop targets, hit a scoot, got a double bonus, everybody had to reach in their pocket, put 25 cents in the pot. Winner collected the pot. So one of our engineers was doing really well that night. And the pot, I think, was like 25 bucks. He hit that eight ball target three times, it didn't register. Guess what, within a week, there was a service bulletin out and we were putting those capacitors on. Yeah. Now, that's how that happened. The capacitor does solve the problems. We're opening up Bally games from 40 years ago yeah. and they still have the original capacitors. When they, they start to dry out, you get, you get intermittent closures. Yeah, yeah, you get unexpected yeah. closures. So the first thing you can do is cut them off or unsolder them and then the second thing you do 
is put new ones on. That's what you should do. Now, here's the big question. Why wasn't this fixed in the 6803 series? Because the 6803, the next Bally board system, has those stupid little capacitors on them. I can tell you the reason. Bally had really good uh, bean counters. You know how much those capacitors cost in the yes, quantity they, we buy them in? Uh, three cents each? A tenth of a penny. Okay, a tenth of a penny. To fix it on the board would have cost maybe a penny. But the board was being brand, brand new made. They knew there was a problem. They were making the 6803, this wonderful new board, yeah. they said. They couldn't have figured out how to fix that problem. I would like, you know, well, somebody, uh, they, The capacitors were like, it was like the, those in the little diodes. We paid less than a, a fraction of a penny. Well, the like diodes we could deal with. We never have a problem with the diodes. And they knew how to solder them on the play field. And well, the capacitors are a pain. However, it should be noted that if you buy a brand new capacitor and solder it on, it won't go bad in your lifetime. Probably not. Right. So you will get another 40 years they out of They make them better cats. in China now than they used to in Taiwan. They did last a long time. <laughs> now. Bally production. Pinballs are, are selling like hotcakes. You're mm -hmm. churning out these wonderful games, all the games we remember, strikes and spares. Wait mm -hmm. a minute. Suppose, suppose you wanted to buy one for yourself. Were you, or what happened to the samples that you played? In other words, you're working on a, a pinball, and then you say, I would like to have one of these in my house. What happened? Tell us. If you were lucky, they would give one to you, but you had to wait your turn. So the, f the first game I worked on was, uh, like I said, bow and arrow. Wasn't my turn, I was the new guy. But I did an experiment. We were testing, doing a test with um, uh, strikes and spares. We you must remember? have had, I think we had four of them in the basement, and, and we had them rigged up with little sensors so they would play all by themselves. They would flip by themselves. I think it was just an endurance experiment to see how long they would go Forever. before they wore out. <laughs> Ballet game would play forever. No, I had to reset them like every other morning. But <laughs> when I was all done, uh, my boss, I worked for a gentleman named Frank Brock. He was head of R&D. And he came down uh, stairs to the basement and he said, hey, I want you to wax these games up, put on new rubber, clean them up real good. And by the way, that one will be yours when you're all oh, done. Wow. Can you imagine the thrill getting a complete full pinball machine from your boss at the work, at work? Yeah, that was... So this is your second new game. You had the wall hanging one. The wall hanging one, the Bally Lane. And then uh, there were two versions. There was the Bally Alley, which was the one you could win a replay on. Right. But there were states you can't win replays. Right. So we had one with the out of match feature and they called it the Bally Lane. And I got a Bally Lane. That we didn't sell as many as those. So I had those two games. Uh, and we then did... Uh, the strikes and Spares. Strikes and Spares. And then we did prototypes of KISS, which I didn't get. They went to the next guys in line. And then we did prototypes of 8-Ball of eight Deluxe. And I would have loved one of those. But again, they were the other guys ahead of me in the line for that. Now, tell us the story about KISS. Sure, I, which I KISS? I understand Iris is here uh, with, uh, he, and also his daughter, his beautiful daughter. They, they're watching. They're camera shy. Off. They won't come into the picture. They're off camera. But you, Iris has told me that you have a wonderful story to share with us about Kiss. So, um, which Kiss are we talking about? And what story? What? What? I really like that. Oh, yes. Okay. So, so Kiss came out. Now on he a, remembers. This is the Kiss story. Okay. So there's like three or four Kiss stories. So this is the real KISS story. So it was, uh, I want to say 1978, I think it was, when we were working on KISS. Could have been 79. Uh, KISS came down to Bali to uh, do their publicity photographs. So in those days, uh, when the flyer would come out, you'd see pictures of KISS, and they would do, the, they would do that. And they showed up in all this uh, costume? costume and... No, they just, four guys. Could be ordinary business guys. You could have been in the loop. And there'd be four business guys with briefcases and suits. And they just walked in and they were signing contracts and stuff. So well, we're going to take them out for a nash. We're going to go down to the deli on uh, Addison. I said, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'll come along. So it was Jim Patla, our marketing guy. I think it was Tom Neiman at the time. And I just hung out. 
and we took him out for, for lunch. We, got, we had like a corned beef or something. Came back from lunch, and then they get into their makeup and stuff and pose for their pictures. A complete, uh, a complete, a complete trans, what do you call it? Transformation. And so here's a 26 year old guy hanging out with these big rock and roll stars making one of the all time most popular pinballs ever made. And, well, at the time, I, you know, who knew it was gonna be that popular? How can it not be? It's still popular today. Well, that's uh, unbelievable how collectible and incredible Kiss came. And then we wound up doing a one-off talking version, which people talk about to this day. So we'd have something to compete with Gorgar at the uh, AMOA show. That's the one that everybody wants to talk about. Well, can you tell us a little about it? Sure. So they had um, they had this thing called the uh, Bad Idea Graveyard, the Lame Idea Warehouse. So somebody would bring something in and they didn't want to do it, like anti-static glass for the game. Like five hundred dollars. Throw it up. <laughs> uh, I could see anti-glare glass like we have now. No, anti-static. They were afraid that the static electricity would zap the boards. So that we'll, never we'll put happened. this special glass on it and it's, it's electrified and it, it, it was terribly expensive. So they had this place, they would just throw th things in. They had like, somebody had designed a cabinet made of fiberglass, fiberglass pinball cabinet, which was so light the game would bounce around. So we couldn't use that. And somebody had brought in a stack of boards with chips on it and it could talk, it could produce maybe, I don't know, a minute of, not even a minute, maybe 30 seconds of barely intelligible voice. And then um, we weren't going to use any of it. And then somebody said, Williams is going to have a talking pin at the MOA show. A talking pin? We got to have a talking pin. What, what, what do we got that talks? Well, we have some boards that are in the, we put aside. Get them! Put them in that new fiberglass cabinet. Let's go! So we scrambled for like three weeks. We recorded, it would say things like K-I-S-S. -S. And then if you tilted it, it would go, too much rock and roll. And we, we put this all together and, they, and um, we got it off to the AMOA show and just in time. And they had their Gorgar with the volume cranked up and that thing would scream, Gorgar. And our game would scream back, Kiss. You know, and after that show, the AMOA, they put uh, noise limits on. They had like a noise meter and you couldn't be louder than a certain amount. But that was, um, that was a magical show. Oh, man. That. And I, to this day, I get a lot of people ask me, what's, what's the deal on the talking kiss case? So, well, well, where did, it, did the board survive? It, it obviously I'm never told, made production. I, I actually ran into Jim uh, Patla about a year ago and I asked him if he knew anything about what happened to that game. Because I found it, it was in the warehouse and it was all cracked and broken up. And he said they could, they tried to destroy it. They tried to throw it in a garbage compactor. They could not destroy that game. It would not die. Well, they could have given that to one of the employees. <laughs> oh, you know what? I would have thrown it off the roof like this. They tried to do that, I think, and it just, it didn't survive. And then of course we had the, the KISS prototype. So we were experimenting with the, with the Intels. So you'll see collectors will talk about the KISS prototypes that have the vacuum fluorescent Gottlieb-like displays in them. And there's like 11 of those floating around out there. Those did get given away and collectors do Why have Why did they now. not choose to use that system? They liked the look of the, um, um, the, the, orange the vacuum. The orange displays. Yeah, like, they just liked the way they looked. They put them side by side. I actually did an experiment. I took some of our games, I modified them with those with the, uh, the vacuum, the blue. The blue color, yes. I tried it and they just didn't look, they just liked the look of the orange. I actually think I saw a couple of those prototypes that have the uh, blue lights, blue glasses. Yep, the Kiss games think, had them. I think them. the, the uh, Las Deluxe Vegas. Had them. I think Las Vegas had a couple in their museum. Yeah, yeah and then they, and then our, our beloved partner Midway, who did all the manufacture of the boards, they would make these purchases because I remember when we did, uh, we wanted to do seven digit display panels. Right. And they said, well, we've got about a million six digits in the warehouse. What are we supposed to do with them? Oh, now I got to tell you, Alan told me this. This is how we first met on my YouTube channel in the comments. And Alan told me this fascinating story he's about to tell you about 
what they did with the six-digit games, the six, all the extra displays. They had a, they must, they made a bulk purchase to save money. So we said, okay, we're going to seven-digit displays. We got about a million six-digit displays. What are we going to do with it? Okay, first of all, you'll put a six-digit in the match window. R the good, match good window. Idea. You can use it up there. And we went to the game designers and say, look, we got a boatload. It's not the word I use, but a boatload. <laughs> I like that word. Of uh, six-digit displays. Tell you what, figure out a way to incorporate this in the play field and other places. And then you had a whole bunch of games come out in that time that had a display panel under the play field. Like Medusa. The Medusa, I think Vector had one. And that was just to use up these stupid display panels. But, but you know what? It was so clever, Alan, because by putting the extra display on, it looked like Bally said, Wow, we're giving you extra stuff in your game, more toys in your game. And in fact, they were just using up what they could never use what again. What they would do is they would tell the game designers that Greg can mix the Patlas and all that. They'd say, look, every part you put on your game is going to cost this much. You have a budget of this much. So you can throw whatever you want on there, but it's, this is your budget. But tell you what, displays are free. We're not going to charge you, so it won't count against your budget. Do you think it was just those two games? Uh, our viewers right now are saying, no, it's this other. I can't think of any offhand. Uh, the Vector and what was the other one? Did Spectrum have one? I'm trying to think Spectrum. Spectrum. Ooh. I'm trying to think of Spectrum. I don't know that was if a Spectrum bad had one. That's a game that they couldn't give away. <laughs> Can, oh, wait a minute. You did tell me this poor Spectrum. Now, you see, now people appreciate it. Especially after Mastermind came out, yeah. which was the, the uh, game where you try to uncrack the code, so to speak. S Spectre, Spectrum required some thinking. Yeah, I was showing my daughter how to play it earlier, and uh, she's like, what is this? <laughs> Where's the ball shooter but, at? But Why once, is the ball sticking out? Once you understood what you were doing... It was fun, but, but nobody, nobody understood. It. Nobody understood. Poor so Spectrum. So we must have made. Um, they ordered parts to make 900 games. Okay. I don't think they. I think they sold maybe 300. So there's 600 games were sitting in the warehouse forever. The whole game. Yeah, they they they're boxed and ready Assembled, to go. Assembled, boxed. Nobody would Spectrum. buy them. Nobody would buy them. They wound up uh, stripping them, taking them apart, and recannibalizing them. And, wow. Uh, well, well you, got, you got a good coin door, uh, you got all the electronics, but you couldn't do anything with the play field. No, that, had, that went in the trash. Oh, my. But they would strip off the light sockets, would come off it. And now, you know what's assemblies. interesting about Spectrum? I've had two or three pass through TNT, and they've all been heavily used. Uh -huh. They were played. I don't know why people say they, I mean, these machines were played, the play fields were worn. And Interesting. So they, it's not like you came across brand new games. Uh, I came across other games. I've never in my life seen a nice play field on Frontier, for instance. We offered them They're worn to, out. We offered them to um, distributors at a substantial discount. We say, so take them, strip them for parts if you want, and they got rid of a few of them that way. So there was another game, uh, Rapid Fire. And that, um, that, that was the, I'm not sure if Rapid Fire or Hyperball came out, but they... Hyperball was Williams. Each of them we were listening at the door. Wait a minute, they're coming out with a Rapid Fire pinball. You know, I got to tell you a story. When Hyperball came out, Eastern Distributing was the Williams distributor, and ba Banner in Philadelphia was the Bally mm -hmm. distributor. And Phil Sternberg had owned Eastern. He was one of the owners. I uh, came into the door as I usually come in. He says, Todd, you got to come in my office. He had all the lights out in his office, and there was the hyperball sitting there. This is the future of pinball. That's what everybody thought. The future of pinball. That's what everybody thought. And he's, go ahead and play it. These are going to sell like hotcakes. We are going to go to, and I started playing it. Pow, 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 pow. And my you know, deafening sounds and uh, firing. And so what the hell is happening? And I'm trying to figure it out, just like you would when you first started playing the pinball. And, when, the, and then it, when it was over and all the lights were, stopped flashing, it had flash lamps in it. First game with an alphanumerical display, too, on mm -hmm. the bottom of the play field. What do you think of it? And I, I was honest with you. I said, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not really pinball. <laughs> it's little pinballs. And I got to tell you, two weeks later, 
almost every hyperball was returned to Easter music. Yeah. It was too loud or it broke. It didn't work. And the uh, firepower has the same thing. Well, no, rapid fire, rapid fire worked better. Well, rapid fire, rapid, rapid fire. fire. So, Ra but rapid fire, same thing. They thought they were going to sell right. a ton of them. They ordered a boatload of parts. And I don't know, so many of them came back. They had all of these cabinets and all um, ready, built and ready to go. That's how you got 8 Ball Deluxe Limited Edition. That's how you got Centaur. They repainted the unsold rapid fire cabinets. So they were parted out. And those play fields yeah. got thrown out, you think? Um, yeah, they, when, the, when they closed the pinball, they closed the pinball division in uh, at the end of 84, I want to say. And then everything, um, they literally got tossed. They struggled. Uh, I remember uh, my old boss, Doug, and a few other guys, they went through the parts bins in the warehouse to trying to salvage stuff that they were going to throw up. Now, Schematics didn't it move to Midway at that point? Midway absorbed the pinball because everybody thought, oh, the video game was the future. Let the video game company take this over. So, in other words, Bally closed uh, this part of Bally in about 84. Yeah. Midway picked up the... The, all the parts and stuff and took them mm -hmm. into the bally wing. Now the rapid fires, in fairness, is dependable and it runs well and you can still see it to this day and some people like it and it's actually quieter. So bally did it right, they got everything right and I gotta tell you about the hyperballs, they all, I ended up buying them brand new from Easter Music they were new but out of the box. They yeah. were returns. I got them for $125 each. Wow. I must have bought 20 of them. I sold them out on my driveway. I think I got as much as 400 a piece for them. And, they, and people loved it because it's a brand new $2,000 machine. They got it for $400. We're like new. How long they lasted? Not long. All I know is I had a rapid fire in the employee lunchroom and every day, it was broken every day. I had to go up. And Fix it. It was all oh. the fuse was always blowing. The five volt. Fuse. Well, the key. Well, you know, if you have a fuse that's blowing in your game, what you do, uh, Iris probably has knows a lot about this. You go in, open up her kitchen drawer, you get some uh, t uh, uh, aluminum foil, and you wrap that fuse all over aluminum foil. Put it back in. Fuse will never blow again. There you go. If I had had that, man, I could have kept that game going. Oh, Bally might have burned down. Oh. <laughs> well, nobody, I guess nobody took a rapid fire home, did they? No. The rapid fires found their way to a landfill somewhere in uh, Mokina or something like that. It's interesting, though, that uh, Spectrum had met such a poor fate, too. It was. Uh, innovative ideas uh, that the public wasn't ready for. But now there's people that are searching out these rare treasures. They are treasures. Well, Spectrum's They're, rare because, they, like I said, there's probably only, probably less than 300 in existence. And how many of those really survive? That's what I said. It's probably only a few hundred we're down to maybe of Spectrum. Or maybe even less than that, yeah. But it's good value. If you buy it, you'll probably get it at a good price and find one. Well, you'll pay a lot more than they were years ago when, because, as you, ever, you already know, there was a high point. I remember going to auctions where you could buy Kiss and Power Play and Mata Harry. And they had them for 100, 200, 300, 400 bucks. You could buy them all day long for that because the new pinball was coming out. All the new innovations, there's so many manufacturers. You know, in 1981, the seven different manufacturers in America churned out 181,000 plus pinball machines. But last year, last year, Alan, they made under 10,000 machines. They're very small runs now. Small runs, but good runs. At this show, the Pinball Expo, Alan, you've, you've seen it, and, and, uh, and you two are watching on the sidelines, have seen some wonderful, neat, innovative games in here that are they're, they're low runs. The Jetsons is in here, Houdini. Um, there's actually some one-of-a-kind games in there that people are thinking of putting in production. And the interest is still there, Alan, it really is. But the days of making 20,000 machines of anything are finished. Yeah, you reached a point, and we, I saw this when I was there, the physically you could, not, uh, you could not earn enough money in coins to justify the cost of the game. That's, what, that's what happened. You, you got to the point 
where a 25 cents a coin could not, you could not charge enough to pay for the cost now of the game. Now think about this. In 1977, pinballs were a quarter to play. The digitals were a quarter. Sometimes if you put two quarters in, you got three games. That's where they started out. Okay. Okay. Now, 1980, Williams the Black Knight introduced 50 cents a game play. Yeah. But at five ball, they set them at five ball, although the factory default was three. Mm -hmm. They tried it and experimented, and it was successful. Hey, 1980, we're up to 50 cents a game. However, in the same arcade, you could buy a soda for 50 cents. You could buy a candy bar for 35 cents. But let's roll the clock ahead, buddy. Uh, 35 years later, it's 50 cents to play most of the new pinballs. And at most is a dollar. I mean, we're struggling to get a dollar out of people, but the soda is three dollars. It's not 35 cents. <laughs> the candy bar is 250. So pimples never kept pace. So what Alan said earlier a moment ago, when you bought a brand new Gorgar, which was the highest priced pimple of its time at $14.99, a lot more than the Bally 8 ball or, or but now the same pinball machine is six thousand dollars. It's four times the amount what it was, but it's the same admission to play, 50 cents or right. maybe a dollar. It didn't keep pace. Technically, it should be five dollars to play. It should be, if everything kept pace with everything they else. They were really hoping the dollar coin, remember the Sue's the dollar Anthony coin. dollar? Yes. They were really was, hoping that would be the future. It, As you, you would know, reach in your pocket and put that Susan B. Anthony in. It's a lot easier than reaching in on. and getting a bill out. Now, Alan, maybe I got some trivia. What was the first Bally game? If you watch my videos, you know the answer. The first Bally pinball machine that was made with a dollar bill acceptor. Was it Centaur? No. Was it Centaur? I don't know. You I... mentioned it earlier, Vector. Vector had that? I, I had two different Vectors with a dollar bill acceptor. Well, I have a factory installed. I have a funnier story about Vector. Yes. Oh, I'd love so to hear it. So I coined a term for pinball machine. Vector had so many features on that play field. Tons. They were trying to clear parts out of the warehouse. They told <laughs> Greg Kamek, a good friend of mine. Do everything. Put anything you want on that play field, whatever you want. You, you, put, you had a play field with so many features, there was no room for the ball to roll to hit them. And I called that Vector Syndrome. Vector you system. flip the ball and the ball couldn't go anywhere without hitting it. You have to play a vector. No, no, I take that back. You have to play a restored vector. It's only fair to play a game that's been really rebuilt. And with LEDs, vector is, is like, it's a beautiful piece of equipment. It's, it's, a, it's a work of art. As long as the drop targets aren't broken off, because the drop targets were so close bang, to the flipper, they bang, were just breaking in. Bang, And I love it, whenever I come up to a vector, over the years, I mean, you've all been there, and it's no longer the factory targets. They had unique targets for that yeah. machine. You'll see a star, you'll see bullseye, you'll see like a little creature. Whatever you had, Whatever you had nobody ever bought the right targets. That, forget that. But now these days, we can get all these wonderful replacement parts. You can make the vector look just as, no, better, because you can light a vector with LEDs, baby. Yeah. Not only we have to put sunglasses on, but you have, people will be drawn to the game because of the lighting. Can you imagine what the world would have been like if you had LEDs back then? All the fun you guys could have had. Well, I could have, the, the games would have weighed half as much because I wouldn't have had to put that big transformer. A lot light because you only have to create enough voltage to make the high voltage for the displays. Now, of course, today, all the new Stern machines, there's no transformer in the Right, because they're all using LEDs. Right, everything is LED, oh, everything lightweight. Everything was the, uh, the LEDs. We, uh, we, we didn't have them back then. You know, we just had uh, the little uh, 44 bulbs, and right. then the, the, the 444s, and then they said, no, the 555 was cheaper. Use this 555, and, and they crappier. all burned out. Oh, <laughs> they, they, you know what? I always used to think there was a rumor that Bally's Transformers, it's probably true, ran the bulbs full tilt. They ran them at 6.5 volts yeah. or 6.3, where Williams and Gottlieb would run them a little lower. They'd run them around six. So this is true. The 555s, 
were blowouts so fast. So quickly. And I remember some of the vendors would take the 555s out and put a 194 in a 12 volt bulb and it would never burn out but it was like you're looking it at this play field enough. and you're saying, God, I can't see anything. What's lit on the play? And, and the vendor would say, I'll never have to change another bulb again. It's, but it's, nobody will play the game because you couldn't well, see it. When the games first came out, we had this power supply board. Everybody knows that Valley Power Supplies, the connectors would always burn up. That's right. And they, they kept coming back and, the, and we went to um, Molex. They said, well, that should work. And said, well, it's not. They're burning up. He says, oh, that's because you put the board on top of the transformer. It's too hot. Move it to the side. That'll fix it. So we did. We redesigned it and put the board on the side. Okay. And I guess they kept burning up. They still kept burning up. So we went back to Molex and we said, our, our, these games are getting returned to these power supplies. He says, oh, you know, we have this new connector. It's got three sides. It's a Trifurcon. Switch to that and this problem will be fixed. Oh, okay, great. So we switched to that. It still kept burning up. It did. And then the, the Europeans were very adamant. Says, you fix this and we're never importing another game. And so uh, my boss, uh, Doug McDonald, came to me and said, we gotta fix this. So we called up their Molex's competitor, AMP was the name. And they said, um, we have this thing called the Universal Mate Lock. It will not burn up. We redesigned the power supply around that with bigger, heavier duty bridge rectifiers. We never had another power supply problem again. Now, was that the one in the bottom of the game? That's when they moved it to the bottom. So if you think about this, you're right, Alan, because I can't think of a single, I can't think of a single connector on the bottom ever burning up. The only thing that we lost were the bridges. So the two bridge rectifiers on the bottom, one for coils and one for lamps, mm -hmm. occasionally one of the bridges would open. So one of the things... But they were much with. more reliable oh, than the original gosh, ones. Oh absolutely. And then he, he took out, he said, well, we're not going to use a bridge for the high voltage because it's such a small current. I'm just going to put four diodes on the board. And the diode was a great idea too. That, and they that just were, saved time. I said they were like a tenth of a penny and they did the job. But that, that fixed uh, that problem. That's right. We never had any of the newer, I guess, 1982. Yeah, I think April, the, I April Deluxe was the first game to use that redesigned power supply. Okay, was that on the bottom? Yes, it was on the bottom. I remember that now because they also put the ballast for the fluorescent bulb for the limited edition. So I'll tell you one last funny story here. So in those days when you put those things together, you had a big vat of grease. And a guy had to take a, a little paintbrush out of the grease and put it on the back of the bridge, and they would screw it to the yes, of bottom course. of the board. So somebody, uh, one of the vendors, heat sink, heat sink. It would heat the, the chassis of the power supply was the heat sink. Great idea. So one of the vendors came to me and says, "I got something better than a grease. No more messy grease. I have this pad. You just peel it off and you stick it on. It does the job of the grease. No more grease. This is great." So I said, "Okay, we're going to start using that." So I go down to the, the I go down to the factory. And the guy that used to put the, um, the grease on, he was really sad. He says, Tony's really sad. Said, What's wrong? He took away his job. So what are you talking about? The guy had lost his fingers in an accident. He had no fingers on his hand. He couldn't, he, he would put the grease on because he could put the grease on with his hand. He couldn't peel off and put the stickers on. Wow. Poor guy. So they had to find another job for Tony down in the factory. Oh boy. I don't recall these pads. Yeah, so you, you, all the newer games that came out, instead of grease, they have a stick-on square pad on the back okay. of the bridge rectifiers. Well, we now change, especially if you're watching and you rebuild these machines, you should put two new bridges in. First of all, the lights will get brighter, the, the yeah. lighting. And if you're putting LEDs in, you want your LEDs to get full voltage, so they're as, they're as good as they can be. Yeah, LEDs are just a wonderful innovation. You get more brightness, you can do more things with the colors, and they draw a fraction of the power. Mm -hmm. And I remember we had this company called Everything nice. Ravenswood Transformer Company. I don't know if they're still around. They made all the transformers. And they, had to, they made this big, heavy-duty, chunky transformer so we could put extra lights in the game. Because the yes, game designers, like God bless them, they went through their light limit. And we had to put the auxiliary lamp driver well, in. Well, actually, and then you, then you would have two auxiliaries. Vector, 
Uh, I remember one of the uh, techs at um, uh, one of the Philadelphia places, Bally Banner, I, I think it was Joe Connor but now I'm thinking of it. He said, wasn't Vector the one with all the little boards in it? Because it had these little tiny gr green boards that would flash one thing and one would flash another. Well, you had another. the flasher boards and you had the auxiliary. Uh, the auxiliary name uh, drivers. What was I going to say? The solenoid expander board. Right. They, had the, they were all over the, the place. The solenoid expander was just an ingenious idea uh, that uh, I think Lance Chantry uh, came up with. He was one of my counterparts there. And just the idea of using a light uh, bulb driver, SCR, to power a relay that would allow you to double your solenoid. And see what would happen is the solenoid expander, it's a little relay, and they'd ha usually have a light bulb under the play field to indicate when you put it in a test that it's working. So either the light bulb would work or when the solenoid expander was turned on by its own transistor like this, whatever's connected to this side would work. So that would allow one transistor to drive either A, a coil, or B, a light bulb but it couldn't drive both at the same time. Right, so you had to make one sure. One or the other. You had to make sure that the coils on the flip side of the expander were not coils that were normally active during gameplay. So they used them on like memory coil knockdowns and some drop target resets, but it doubled your capacity. It was a great idea to use the existing boards to get lots more coil firings and to make the games more exciting. And the only thing that hurts that, that whole system were cold solder connections. Yes. On the relay, on the solenoid expander board, the back of that relay baby, those, those solder connections would get brittle. Do you know why most of the cold solder connections happened? Because the games were transported from one store to another, they were on the back of the pickup truck jiggling like yes. this. All the header pins are banging around like this, gets to the next locations, put it there, it's there for three weeks, gets backloaded, it's traveling across town to the next location. That after four or five years of that baby, those, those solder connections were shot. They wore down. And every once in a while, somebody would be working on the game, they need a light bulb. They go, oh, look, there's a bulb underneath the play field. It's not doing anything. I'll take that out. And then the expander or the flashboard would stop working because it needed that bulb to work. Well, in most cases it did, but sometimes they'll work without it. I was told that that bulb, whole sole purpose in life was to tell you that the solenoid expander was working. Um, no, no, it, it's, the reason was the chip on that board was uh, MLC 3011. Right. It was an optical chip. The, it could not, it would not draw enough current so that's to why latch the, the SCR. So that's information I got that was wrong. Right, so, they, so they, put the, they put that in series, in parallel. So the current going through the, the dummy light bulb would latch the, uh, S, the so SCR. So that means on. you do need that bulb and you shouldn't put an LED in No, it, it won't work. You should you put that. a regular light bulb in that socket. So right. all, this, all this time I had the wrong information. I'll tell anybody, anytime I see anybody saying my, I've got problems with these coils, they're not falling down. I said, look under your play field. Either the dummy light is missing or it's somebody- It's burned out. Or you replaced all your balls with LEDs, LEDs. and you needed that one. And that's well, usually I gotta the case. tell you, we just did a Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man, which in my opinion is the most nightmare Bally pinball ever made because it's a, the night, I call it the nightmare wiring system because to get to head off, it was a nightmare. Oh, I've seen your video a on it, yeah. Oh, he said we did. But listen, when we were checking it out and I had the play fit out, my uh, service guy changed those bulbs. He put LEDs in there. Now, my conjecture was, don't waste an LED under the play field that cost me 70 cents. Put in a, a 10 cent 555. So I took them out and put the 555s in it, not even knowing until this very filming, <laughs> and because of Alan, actually, I don't think anybody knew that that bulb, in fact, has to be in the circuit to make that solenoid expander dependable. Right, otherwise, we didn't, we didn't have learn it. learned something. As a matter of fact, the first time, the first series of games that went out with that, we didn't have the light, and... Would that have been 8-Bowl Deluxe? What was the first series of games? May have been 8-Bowl Deluxe may have been the first one with the solenoid expander, yeah. Because it had the, had the memory coils, the memory targets. A brilliant idea. By the way, whose idea was it not to reset all the targets if you're player two? See, on that game, if, yeah. you're play, if only one person plays, 
the targets don't come up and drop down again. Mm -hmm. They stay down. So, and somebody told me the reason was it saves wear and, the, and tear of the mechanism. If you're playing uh -huh. two players, they come back up, and then the second player knocks them down. And then when that ball drains, the, those targets reset, and then it knocks the targets down where it left off. But if you just play one player, yeah. they very cleverly say, well, we're going to leave the targets where they are. Now, none of the other manufacturers did that. Gottlieb's and Stern's remote targets always popped up, yeah. and then they dropped them. But right. Eight Ball Deluxe, was that, your first, was that the first memory targets? Um, it might oh, have I been. should know this. I might have known that. So you don't know whose idea was it, the program? I do know that the guy that did the, the programming on that game, he was one of the founding engineers for the cellular phones at Motorola. The guy went over there, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he went on to Motorola and worked on the cellular phone project. Wow. Uh, and he was the one, I know, he came up with the idea of when the game was set for three ball, have the soundboard say three ball. Three the game ball. Goes. Remember and when you, you turned it on? It would go five ball because the soundboard already had that in there. So he may have figured all that out. You know what? That was like a little extra touch that they did. When you turned it on, now you know. So, and, and I, I said, I wonder why. It says, I guess it's just testing voice. And somebody said, no, if you put it on five balls, it's five ball. I think my lady friends are getting tired. So I think You're getting tired. Yeah, for the one night. question. Yes. One question. I want to know about Baby Pac-Man. Do you have any kind of stories about Baby Pac-Man? The, uh, you mean the, um, the pin? Uh, the pin the video. Hybrid, the hybrid. They made 7,000 of them, Alan. Why? They we tried, it was big. We tried playing that game, and it's unplayable, that game. I, Iris was, I was showing it to Iris. I said, you, you see this? All right, right. So uh, Steve Ackerman, great multi-talented engineer. He reverse engineered Pac-Man to make the video board. Lance uh, Chantry. Bless his soul was the guy that could come up with all the crazy names. Came up with the name Vidiot for that board. And it was, we had, the, we, we had the rights, but not the actual ownership of the program for Pac-Man. So they, but they were determined to milk Pac-Man for as much as they could. So they, why not, why not make a Pac-Man pinball hybrid? And that's how baby Pac-Man was born. But I just thought it was unplayable. I never thought the game was playable. Now, Alan, you're aware that they made five mini ones that you sat at in a chair to play. Yeah. And I have one of the five in my collection. This now, is, do you ever play it? Uh, <laughs> I I, I've play played it, but you have to play it in a chair. Yeah. So they must have said, well, this isn't going to work out. We need to have a standing model. They I had play mine a lot, but the Pac-Man's so hard on it. Like you can't even get, sometimes you can't even get back down to the, I know. the pinball part. It's, uh, I... I love it though. They made a ton of them. 7, I can't 000. tell you why. Well, Ooh. they must have sold them. Were there any left over at the factory? Not that I'm aware of. I think they sold them. Video games were hot. Pac-Man was hot, so why not get they rid of some pinball sold. parts while we're at yeah, it? They did. They, and, and they did a good job. And then they made a follow-up to that Granny and the Gators. Yeah, and that was, I was gone by the time that game came out. I was So let's there. see, Granny and the Gators was uh, 83. So did you leave uh, about 83? So 80? I left in the spring of 83. Yeah. Did you keep ties, because we're almost out of time, did you keep ties with any people from Bally over the years? Oh, sure. Uh, Greg Kamek and I were, were close for a long time. So Greg, uh, my old boss, Doug McDonald, matter of fact, I just brought Doug down to the show for another interview a couple of years ago. And I understand you just did a story for the Pinball Magazine. In uh, the Pinball ma in the, the KISS Pinball Magazine, there's actually an interview with me and I talk about um, uh, the, the Bally Lane game and I talk about the KISS prototype and the talking KISS. And it's See? a pretty good one. She, uh, Iris has got a copy. And, I, and I we've, covered all, uh, we've covered more in, in we've territory. We've scratched things. the surface. Maybe next year we can do another one. Well, of these. this is interesting. So you were there a total of seven years. I was, it was, yeah, that's about right. Now, can you tell us one final thing? Uh, tell us, what, what, what was your overall experience at Bally? It was a dream job, I tell you. For a kid, just out of college, this was the most fun you could have. You have your dream job, I wish it paid better, but it was okay. I, you, 
Be there until eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night sometimes playing pinball. And, and this was your job. Years. And the golden years, Alan, you were there. I was there and wow. it was, it couldn't, and then to this day, I, I still come down to this expo and all that. And I marvel at how the new generations have redone, recreated everything that I worked on. And listen, Alan is looking for a really nice power play. That's the game he has settled on. And he, of course, wants it decked out in LEDs. <laughs> so that would be someone, and I'm sure he'll comment in this video. So if you say, hey, I've got one, Alan may be able to contact you. My him. son is a huge Blackhawk fan. I just know if I have a power play at home, he'll come over and visit me more often. That's, that, what a great way to, to so, and uh, thank so, you very much. Thank you, thank Alan, you Alan, this was, what, what a treat, what a treat. All because of YouTube, that's how we met. That's right. Now, will you continue watching my videos? I'm not, I can't stop, I'm addicted to them. Should I? No, no, I won't. <laughs> I, I'll do it to everybody else, but I can't do it to Alan because this is one of the original Bally people. There was there at the, at the wonderful years, and you've really helped us out. Thank you very much. Thanks to Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. For this wonderful equipment. We're on two cameras. So now, and, and you did film me in widescreen, right? Yes. Okay. Cinerama.